Hey again, junior high. We're back again for week 28. Can you believe it? We only have four weeks left in the school year. What? Four weeks. So, um, I do not, I'm not counting on us being to get together in May. I'm still hoping, but I'm afraid it might not happen and this might be the rest of the school year. Uh, this past week, you were finishing your paper on bestiaries. Hope you enjoyed reading and learning about bestiaries. Kind of cool. Uh, some of you responded to me and said, this is something I didn't know about. This has been pretty interesting. Um, so I wanted to, to tell you, um, when the libraries reopen, I don't know if you know, especially if you live in Illinois, the Prairie Cat system, you can get a book sent to you from anywhere in Illinois. Also, if you go to the librarian, she can do an interlibrary loan for you. You can get a book from anywhere in the country. And there are replica bestiaries available that you could just have sent if you're just really interested and you want to see, you know, you're, some of you are writing about the illustrations um, and some of the crazy weird animals. Also, one of the uh, books that I gave you, uh, uh, an excerpt from, is by Jonathan Hunt. It's a picture book for children about bestiaries, and it has some very funny animals. My, my children, when they were little, loved that particular book. And uh, there were these little lambs tethered to a plant, and they would graze around the perimeter, but then they could only go so far because they were tied and then they would starve to death after they ate all the grass. It was, it was horrible. My, my kids just loved it. So after this is over and when the libraries reopen, maybe you should go to the library and get a loan of a book that's an actual replica medieval bestiary. So you should have finished your bestiaries this week. Um, please email them to me uh, at, at your earliest convenience here because they're due this week. And I will get back to each of you, trying to give each of you individual feedback. If I notice mistakes, tell you the things I noticed that you did great. Some of you are using your alliteration. Good for you. A couple of you sent me your rough drafts or some early paragraphs uh, last week. Please feel free to do that um, when for the next couple of assignments. If you just want to know, am I doing this right? Does this sound good? Email me an early copy, and I'll be very glad to go over it with you. Um, so I would like you to um, stop the video, pause the video, and if you haven't gotten a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper, please run and get one and come back and start the video again. I'm assuming you just did that, and you're back with your paper and pen, because we're going to do a new assignment. I told you that we only have four weeks, I think I told you, we only have four weeks left, which we're going to do two more papers in that time, two more five paragraph papers. So that means we're spending two weeks on each one. So the assignment I'm giving you today is due in two weeks. So I will give you some guidelines about what you should get done in the next week. All right. Remember, you can always, just like I just said, send me rough drafts or sample ideas, and I will get back to you on those and tell, give you some feedback. We are going to write what is called an argumentative essay. We haven't done these really so far, and it's a good skill to have. It does not mean arguing and being angry. Argumentative, in this case, means defending a point of view, having, having a, an opinion, and having reasons for the opinion in a way that you hope to tell someone else that your opinion is right and maybe theirs is wrong that would be kind of going into a persuasive this is also to persuade too but call it an argumentative essay having a viewpoint and backing it up this is really important in life you know we have lots of opinions we all have opinions right and we should know why we have those opinions we shouldn't just have them for no reason we should know why. And of course, the biggest thing we have an opinion about is our Lord, right? Jesus is God. The church teaches the truth. And apologetics is the, um, 
the pursuit of defending those truths. Uh, the Apostle Paul says to always have a reason for the hope that is in you. So we are called to have opinions and defend opinions. So we're going to work on that, but we're going to defend an opinion on something a little less uh, grave and important than uh, the faith. All right. So now this is where your pen and your paper come in handy. Uh, grab them because we're going to go over some ideas of topics that you could use. You may choose your own topic. These are simply ideas, but they need to be a topic on which you can have an opinion. Okay. Bestiaries, for example, isn't really a topic you have an opinion on. They just are. Right. Um, but uh, whether or not bestiaries reflect reality, that you could have an opinion on that. That would be a very specific topic, though. Ours are going to be a little broader. Okay, I'm going to scoot over so I can make room for my whiteboard. And let's write down some ideas of topics on which you could have an opinion. All right, remember, these are only suggestions. You may choose your own. Okay, the first one is daylight savings time. All right, you may ask, how would I have an opinion on daylight savings time? A lot of people have opinions. A lot of people think we should just abolish it. You know, because you turn the clocks forward, no, back, fall back, in the fall. And then you know how it's so dark at night and the sun goes down at five and you can't do anything in the evenings and your dad comes home from work in the dark? It's no fun. And, of course, it's lighter in the mornings when people are getting up and going to work, but you pay for it in the evenings. And a lot of people say, you know what, we should just quit it. We should just stop. And how about we just turn the clocks ahead in the spring and leave them that way perpetually. And there are a few states, there are some areas that do that. Parts of Indiana do not change their time, which makes them very awkward because they don't match the surrounding areas for half the year. But if we all did it, or didn't do it, we could have light in the evening all year round. Um, it would be dark in the morning, but anyway, this is something you could have an opinion on. Okay, another idea is cats versus dogs. Which is a better pet? Some people are cat people. Some people are dog people. And so... You could pick cat or you could pick dog and you could defend them as being the, the best pet. Or maybe snakes are the best pet. Maybe iguanas, maybe rabbits. I don't know. Mice. Pick your own and defend why it is the best pet to have. Okay. Um, another idea is chewing gum. Good or bad? Chewing gum can strengthen your jaw, I guess, but it can wear out your jaw too and make it sore. And you know, some gum has sugar in it. That's not good for your teeth. But some gum sort of, some people say the gum, non-sugared gum sort of cleans off your teeth. And some people don't like the way, they don't like hearing people smack, especially those people that chew with their mouth open. Um, so, is chewing gum a good thing or a bad thing? Just an idea. Uh, another idea is eggs. Um, how should you cook them? What is the best way to cook an egg? Defend it. Do you like the yolks runny or not runny? Hard boiled, deviled eggs, uh, fried, fried with yolks runny, fried with yolks not runny. Um, scrambled, uh, fried on a bagel egg sandwich, scrambled wrapped up in a tortilla. All right. What are the best, what's the best way to cook an egg? Um, how about bacon versus sausage? Which one is the best breakfast meat and why? Um, ooh, this one's a little more serious. 
bicycle helmets. Should you, should you be forced to wear a bicycle helmet? They're sweaty. Sometimes they're uncomfortable. They can save your brain, though, if you fall off your bike. So, okay. So these are these are simply ideas. You do not have to choose one of these. These are ideas for you to use in case you just don't know. Um, ooh, this would here's would be a good one. Online learning versus meeting in person. Which one is better? Here, I'm gonna scoot over again. Okay, because we're we're being uh, a lot of you take online classes anyway, but now we're being forced to meet online here with the with the recorded lectures. Is one better than the other? Um, hedges around your house versus rock trimming. Um, annual flowers versus perennial flowers. Skiing versus snowboarding. That's a good one. Short hair versus long hair. That would be better for the ladies. Um, anyway, anything you could have an opinion on. That's the important thing. It's not just information. It's something you actually have an opinion on. So if you have an idea and you're not sure if your idea is any good, Email me your idea or call me and I will say, oh, I love that idea. Or I will say, you know, that doesn't seem like something that you can really have a strong opinion on. Let me help you alter that topic a little bit and make it better. Okay? So how are you going to do this paper? Oh, I need my whiteboard again. I'll grab it. I'm not going to scoot over again. So say, say you chose cats versus dogs, all right? And say you're going to defend cats as the best pet. That's that's your thesis, all right? That's the opinion that you are going to defend. Cats are the best pets. How would we do that? We're going to do five paragraphs, but remember we always write the body paragraphs first because it's always easier to introduce something you've already written, right? Okay, if you write the introduction and you don't have a paper, you don't know what you're introducing. So this week, you are working on your body paragraphs and what we need to do is outline, first of all. We need to think of three categories, all right? So um, what, what are three things you have to do for a pet? You have to take care of them um you have to play with them and you have to um live with them all right this is not an exhaustive list of things that that have to do with pets all right so now i would brainstorm reasons why cats are easier to take care of than any other animal. Okay, um, they are uh, very independent. Here, I would I would make. Okay, they're independent. They are um, quiet. Oh no, no, let's not do that. Um, they don't. They they use a litter box. So they don't need to go out. Um. What else is easier to take care of, cats? Um, you can. You don't have to ration their food out. Um, they won't eat. You can just dump it in once a day. You don't have to have times. No food rationing. Um, they they like to lay in your lap, so they're easier to uh, brush because they're already laying there. Is there any other way that cats are easier than dogs to take care of? Um, they just they don't bark, right? So they're not they're not loud. All right. So there's some ideas, and then I'd put a clincher. All right. Play. Um, uh, 
cats can amuse themselves better than dogs. Um, how else could cats be easier to play with? Um, there's all sorts of toys. And you can give them catnip toys. They like that. Um, oh, cats will chase, chase those lights. So you can just be sitting. It's not like you have to walk. Oh, and you don't have to walk them. You can just stay at home and let them out the door. Or they don't even go out, maybe. So those are some ways they're easiest to play with. And then I'd put a clincher. Okay. Ways they're easiest to live with. Um, um, okay. The, the, they don't bark. We can repeat that. Um, they um, help me because I can't hear you. You're talking to the screen right now and I can't hear you. Um, how are cats the easiest animals to live with? They're... Um, they're affectionate and they curl up on your lap which which is warm and cozy and it keeps you warm keeps you warm in the winter um cats uh, are entertaining because you can watch them chase things uh like the little light or those those uh toys where the something goes around a circle and they like a little mouse thing looks like it's running around a circle and they chase it it's very amusing um and i don't know i can't think of other ways cats are easy to live with this is obviously not the topic i should do because i don't feel strongly about it and then you'd put a clincher all right all right so this is how you would lay out the body that's what i want you to do this week i want you to lay out the body paragraphs of your um of your new paper do an outline which might take you some time in fact i would um i would recommend that you sit down more than once to do your outline sit down and and think of your topic think of something you honest to goodness feel strongly about i don't feel strongly about cats that was a bad choice for me um and pick something big enough and important enough that you could think of a lot of ideas of, of um, defenses of why that's the best opinion also you know you are at home with your family you're not going out a lot right now ask your parents why you know which which they would um, support cats or dogs for instance and ask them why what's give, tell me some things good about them use them as a resource that's okay is that cheating? Ask your brothers and sisters. Call grandma. Ask her. All right? So, first of all, if you are having trouble choosing a topic, you don't like any of those topics I wrote on the board, and you want to pick one, get in touch with me. Call me, email me, and we'll talk it out together. Um, oh, what, how about why Legos are the best toy? why trucks are better than cars or cars are better than trucks see these are just coming to me all right all of these are ideas you will have your own ideas but you can use one of mine and sit down and think of three categories so if we're doing trucks versus cars what we could appearance could be a category and then you could list reasons why trucks look better than cars um usefulness could be a category and then you'd list why trucks are more useful than cars um maintenance could be a category and then you could say why why trucks are easier to maintain than cars okay something like that you're going to think of three categories and then i want you to give me specific information on each one just like i did for cats cat i i said um care was that was a large category Okay, so list some ways cats are easier to care for than dogs. All right, if you're doing online ver learning versus meeting in person, um, convenience could be a category. And then you'd list all the reasons one is more convenient than the other. Does that make sense? 
I hope so. If it doesn't make sense, please call me, email me or call me, and I will walk through it with you. In fact, I will walk through a whole outline together with you. If you call me and you get a pen and paper, we will make an outline together. I don't want to just leave you hanging, okay? But for a lot of you, especially my eighth graders, this is probably, you've done things like this before, and so I don't think it's going to be difficult for you. But if it is, I, I'm here, I'm available, and I want to help you, okay? So I have emailed to each of you a new checklist, the master checklist, just like the one you had for the bestiaries, dress-ups and openers in your introduction and conclusion. But... We're not going to introduce any more uh, openers this year because I'm not here. I'm not, I'm not able to introduce a, a bunch of uh, examples. And especially for my seventh graders, this might be a bit of a challenge. Let's just stick with what we've got. However, you eighth graders, you second year ones, feel free to put all the openers in. All right. One, um, well, I guess I'm going to contradict myself right now. All right, one opener that I'm going to I'm going to talk about because you might want to use it, including you seventh graders. It's pretty easy to use. <clears throat> it's number six. I know we're skipping number five, but if you look on the checklist and look at number six, it says VSS. This stands for very short sentence. I'm like very short sentence. Yes, a very short sentence is a sentence with less than five words or five words or less, okay? And <clears throat> it's for dramatic effect. You know, you had writing some long sentences for me. You've got these who, which clauses, and you've got the www.asia, and I'm making you do all these openers, making your sentences quite long. But sometimes, if you have all these long sentences, and then you slip in a very short sentence, it's got this great dramatic effect. Um, so what if I'm writing a, a paper about um, cats and, and why cats are better? And then I've got all these long sentences talking about how convenient they are and how they don't require much of you and you don't have to let them out, you don't have to walk them. And, and then I just write, cats are spectacular. Three words. And it just, it just makes your readers stop short and, and, and you reflect on all that you've read before. Ooh, cats are spectacular, aren't they? Um, so you can experiment with that. If you're not comfortable, if you're one of my first year students and you're still struggling getting all the rest of your openers and dress ups, don't, don't burden yourself, okay? But for everyone else, if you feel up to the challenge, let's put a VSS in this. In every paragraph, See if you can pop in a very short sentence for dramatic effect. It doesn't matter how it starts, but it needs to be five words or less. All right, and that's a number six opener. But only, only if you feel that you've really got the rest of them down. Okay, so those of you who still feel like, oh, I don't know, I'm still struggling with getting all my openers, I'm, I'm stressed out over this, then you need to work on what we've already learned. But all my second years, can do a VSS and some of my first years are probably ready for that or you just like to experiment with it okay so that's number six VSS very short sentence other than that all the dress-ups we've been doing all the open other openers we've been doing which would be one two three and four and your task this week is to choose a topic do an outline by brainstorming reasons you feel that cats are best, or dogs are best, or trucks are best, or online learning is best, or um, summer is the best season, whatever opinion you're defending. But remember, you're not just giving me information about the topic, you're telling me why your opinion is right. Giving me reasons your opinion is right. Okay, work on that this week. It's not due next week, but feel free to send me anything, uh, your rough drafts, ideas, uh, or send them or call me, okay? And then the second, next week, we'll talk a little bit more about your introduction and conclusion. We'll review that and we'll put the whole paper together. All right? Good luck.
you don't need luck because you have skill, all of you. All right. This, now let's move on to our Dorothy Mills reading, okay? This past week, you read um, the rest of the section about the Hundred Years' War, including about Joan of Arc, which we are reading a whole book about. Let's grab your Dorothy Mills book, pause the video. If you don't have it next to you, pause the video and go get it. Okay, I assume you've done that. And let's take a look at what she has to say. I'm going to add a few things to it. Uh, I hope you got the impression that the Hundred Years' War was just a nasty time to live through. If you don't get anything than that, more than that, that's an important thing to get. Uh, we left off with the Black Prince, Edward the Black Prince, and King Edward III sort of ravaging France. And, ooh, I've skipped just a second. Okay. I'm trying to find my page. Oh, I didn't go too far. Okay, if your book looks like this, it's page 353. If it doesn't, I'm in chapter 21, part 2. Okay? The part that says Limoges. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly, but I think I am. Okay. It says, The peace made in 1360 ended for a time the English invasions, but France was not at peace. Okay, there were a couple of things going on in France. First of all, there was a big uprising. You know, when a, when a government fights a war, it takes a lot of money. You have to buy uh, equipment, horses, armor, weapons, and then the enemy comes through and maybe burns your crops and you lose money that way. It's expensive. And so, to make up for it, the French kings were taxing people. They were taxing them pretty hard. So hard that finally there was a peasant uprising. It's called the Jacquerie because uh, the nickname for a French peasant was Jacques Bonhomme, silly Jack. And so the Jacques rose up in rebellion and it was pretty nasty. They were kind of ravaging the countryside and killing people, killing nobility, because they were just so sick and tired of paying too many taxes and they didn't have enough food to eat. And they were frustrated. All right, so France was dealing with that, uh, first of all. Um, so it talks about uh, bands raiding France. Um, also, during this time, Edward the Black Prince is still stationed in Gascony, which is in the southwest portion of France. Oh, by the way, you know, I sent you out a, um, a map, a Hundred Years' War map last week. Uh, you might want to pull that out again. Pause the video and go get your map and you can follow some of the places here. But Gascony is in the, in the kind of the southwest area and this belonged to England. It belonged to Edward and he would branch out the Black Prince and, and make these little um, forays out into the countryside and burn crops and pillage, which is not good for France. Okay, so it tells you uh, farther on in this section too that um, people started complaining about the Black Prince doing this. And it says, Charles V summoned the Black Prince to Paris as his vassal to answer for his misgovernment. Oh, remember? Kings of England, nobility of England, are vassals of the King of France because if they're, they're French nobles who owe their allegiance to the King of France. But they're fighting the King of France at the same time. It's, it's just very confusing. Edward the Black Prince, no, I'm not, I'm not coming. He says, well, he doesn't say he won't come. He says, I will gladly go to Paris, but it shall be with helmet on my head and 60,000 men in my company. I'll come and take over. It doesn't sound like a vassal. It doesn't sound very, very respectful. So he goes through and he, he besieges Limoges. Now, there's a section here about how brutal the taking of Limoges was. It says 3,000 men, women, and children were killed. Women and children. All right. And not only men who were fighting. And it's just awful. And it is awful. And I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses. This, this is an ugly thing. But there was an, actually a couple of reasons 
why it was so violent that Dorothy Mills doesn't tell you. First of all, Limoges had been held by the English. The English had had owned Limoges and it surrendered to the French without a fight. The French came by and they're like, hey, we want to be French again, which is their right. But it really ticked the English off that this city that they owned and ran just gave up without a fight. They just, they just, from the English point of view, it was, they were traitors. They just went over to the other side. So that's one reason he was so angry at that town and I frankly butchered the people. Another reason that she doesn't tell you is Edward. We're going to talk a lot about insanity today in England and in France. Apparently, Edward, they think he might have had some sort of genetic disorder um, because he was ill a lot. He died fairly young at the age of 46. And apparently, he was known for having like spells of uncontrollable rage and hallucinations. So, there's something wrong with him. All right. So, combine... I'm angry because this town went over to the other side and I have some illness that makes me have fits of rage and, and you get the, the massacre at Limoges. Not long after that, at the age of 46, like I said, he died and um, Edward III, the King of England, died. And Edward's son, Richard II, became King of England. Richard was nine years old. So the, the King of England is now nine years old. And of course, the, the country is not run by a nine-year-old. If, if you have a nine-year-old, if you have a young person being king, then it's always the uh, nobility. They've got uncles, they've got cousins, they've got dukes uh, helping to run the country, and more often than not, fighting with each other over who gets the most control. It's hard for a child king to get good advice because very few of the advisors have the king's interests at heart. They have their own interests at heart. So this is the situation that Richard II finds himself in. At the same time, over in France, Charles VI died. And notice what it says about him. This is in part three. The king, Charles VI, suffered fits of insanity. Oh, I'm sorry. He didn't. He didn't. He's going to die, but not yet. I got ahead of myself. Fits of insanity. Apparently, when Charles VI, the King of France, was in his 20s, he had this episode um, where he, uh, he he was already having a kind of blackout episodes where he was confused. But he was mar they were marching to battle, and accidentally, one of his soldiers let his, his javelin sort of slip a little bit, and it banged on someone else's armor. And when Charles heard the clash of arms, he sort of hallucinated that they were being attacked. And he, he ran around and started attacking his own men. And it took him a while to bring him down. And then he was in a coma for several days. And when he woke up, he didn't remember any of it. But he was never the same again. And he's going to go on for like 20 more years. And he's going to have these fits where he just doesn't, he doesn't remember what he said or did. Again, this is this is not a good way to run a country. So, but he never had them for long enough for someone to take over. You know, it's like, you know, in our country, if the president is gravely ill or killed, the vice president takes over, but you have to announce it. You know, the president has died or the president is no longer capable of running the country anymore and they sign the orders. But the, Charles was never ill enough for long enough for anyone else to take over. So they were coping with that in England. Um, now, uh, it, it skips here from Richard II to Henry V. I'm gonna, just because maybe you'll think it's interesting, I'll give you the rundown. If you don't, it won't harm you to listen for a minute. You don't have to remember this, but Richard II grew up and he really wasn't a very good king. He, he had buddies, who had grown up with him, and he followed their advice. He he turned on his advisors and started uh, having them exiled or killed. And and finally, he had a cousin, and uh, his cousin he banished his cousin because his cousin had had challenged someone to a duel. 
and his his cousin died while he was um, in exile. And Richard then just took all his lands instead of giving them to the guy's son. And so the guy's son, um, who is going to be known as Henry the uh, Fourth, uh, Henry Bolingbroke, took over. He made Richard. He, he got enough support behind him that he made Richard turn over the to the crown. And Richard then died in prison. Um, it's unsure whether he died naturally or whether somebody finished him off finally. So Henry the Fourth was king, but he was always a little nervous because he took over in an unusual way. His son is Henry V. All right, it's the Henry V that we talk about here in part three. Okay, Henry, um, Henry the Fourth, but Henry the Fifth too were enmeshed in French affairs, partly through Spain, sort of a convoluted way. I'm not going to get into. Um, but finally, Henry decided to go take back the lands because in this interim. Much of the land that England had taken had gone back under French control. So he he crossed over the English Channel and invaded first at Harfleur, which he took in about a month. Um, however, after that siege at Harfleur, his his guys were in a bad way. He didn't have a lot of guys. A lot of them were sick. A lot of them were hurt. So he decided to march back to Calais. Look on your map where Calais is. C L C A L A I S. It's port. He's marching back to Calais because he's going to go back to England. But in the meantime, he ends up camping near a place called Agincourt. Agincourt is the next site of the famous battle, but they didn't want it to be a battle. The English said, uh, we'd, rather, we'd rather march home. But if we're going to have a fight, give us a fight. All right. Unfortunately, I was going to get my Shakespeare book out in the in the play Henry V, which has the Battle of Agincourt in it. Shakespeare has Henry V give a rousing speech on St. Crispin's Day. In the morning they woke up and somebody supposedly said, as it says in your book, oh, I wish all those guys that were at home in England and having a holiday because it's St. Crispin's Day were here with us. And in the Shakespeare play, Henry gets up and he says, who is it who wishes so? He says, the fewer of us, the greater honor. And he goes on and he gives this rousing speech. You should look it up. The St. Crispin's Day speech from Henry V. And he says, um, you know what, I'll look, it, I'll look it up and see if, I, if it's on YouTube. I'll send you a link to the YouTube video of that excerpt from the play from a great movie version of the play. And he says, all of you, when we get through this battle, in years to come on St. Crispin's Day, you'll roll up your sleeves and you'll show your scars and you'll say, I got these scars with King Henry on St. Crispin's Day. It was a very rousing speech. He roused them and against all amazing odds, they were victorious. They had those archers the English longbow archers, the French, on the other hand, were still knights on their horses. And the it rained the night before. The area was muddy. The horses slipped in the mud. They trapped the French beneath them. And that versus the English longbows, the French didn't have a chance. The numbers. Some people have estimated 8,000 French dead after the Battle of Agincourt. According to English chronicles, there were only 26 English dead. Now, a lot of people think that can't possibly be. I don't know. It could possibly be. Some people that I've read, they estimate, you know, more realistically, maybe 1,600 English dead. But 1,600 versus 8,000, really? And they were outnumbered to begin with? It was a rousing, amazing victory for the English. All right. Now, in the middle of this section, Dorothy Mills then points out to you to remember that war is not all glory, right? Um, it's not rousing speeches all the time and um, victory over amazing odds. It's an ugly, dirty thing. And it's especially ugly and dirty 
for the people caught in the middle, for the peasants. Um, and you have this lament, the, a French peasant lamenting taxes and lack of food because the enemy has come and burned the crops in the fields or they're afraid to go out in the fields and cultivate the food. Um, we're dying and not from battle. We're dying from famine. We're dying from poverty. And then she put in here this very long uh, plea for war to be over. It's very moving. It's printed in French and English. I hope you read through that. So at the very end of this chapter, it says, England regained Normandy and made a peace. Henry V married Charles VI's daughter, Catherine. And, and their son is going to be the next king of France. That's what the treaty says, which means Dauphin of France, you're out. Henry V and Catherine's son is going to be the next king of France. Not everybody was up for that, which takes us to Joan of Arc, to the last section uh, that you read about Joan, which we're reading in much more detail in our book about Joan of Arc, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. But, um, but this is the setting at the beginning of the Mark Twain book. There are people who are saying, what? You can't just hand over the crown to England. There's no way we're going to let the son of Henry V be king of France. Now, they had a problem because King Charles, remember, is insane. You know, he's having these, these, these bouts. So his wife, Isabeau, at the beginning of, of the Joan of Arc book, it, it, they mentioned sometimes about Queen Isabeau selling them out because the view was the queen was the uh, engineer of the treaty because Charles wasn't mentally fit to set it up and that she basically sold out her own children, married her daughter off to England, booted her son's chances of being the next king of France. And that's why there was such bad feeling against the queen because they thought she's a traitor. She, she handed the keys of France to England. All right. It's not going to turn out exactly uh, the way they think. Um, we have Joan of Arc, obviously, who, and we're going to talk about the book here in a minute, who rallied the men to victory, pushed back. The Dauphin, there, there were actually several Dauphins, uh, this was the youngest, the Joan of Arc Dauphin is the youngest of the sons. All the rest of them had died. So now he's the crown prince. Um, but uh, in the meantime, in England, Henry V died just a few years after Agincourt. He apparently got dysentery, which is an illness you get from drinking polluted water. All right, when you're camping out... Uh, in a country that's been ravaged by war for decades, a lot of the water is polluted. So he got dysentery, and he had this chronic dysentery, which finally killed him. And when he died, Catherine had had a son already, Henry VI. When he was born, they, they announced him king of England and France. Of course, he's not king of France yet, not until Charles VI dies. But Henry V dies, and once again, they have a baby on the throne. Of course, the baby is not ruling. I think he was 18 months old or something when Henry V died. So Henry VI is going to, uh, again, uh, deal with competing interests of the nobles that are running the country in his behalf. And this is going to degenerate into basically a civil war in England which is known as the Wars of the Roses, which I'm not going to go into, which kind of takes us out of the Hundred Years' War. Henry VI is, is never going to be King of France, partly because of all the nastiness going on in England, partly because of Joan of Arc, who pushes back and pushes back until by 1453, Calais, that port of Calais is the only place in France that England owns. They lost it all. At the end of the Shakespeare play, Henry V that I was talking about, Shakespeare says that. In infant bands crowned king of England and France, he said, but he would lose 
their France and make his England bleed. Right, in war, in civil war. That is the story of the Hundred Years' War. Um, it lasted a little over a hundred years, and, and it was all over property. That's the sad thing to me. That's the sad spectacle of people wanting what they don't have. That land is mine and I want it. And by golly, I will fight for it, no matter that thousands of people die. Tens of thousands of people die. And generations of a country are, are wiped out and a country is ruined by war. Last year, those of you who studied with me last year, we, we talked about the war between Sparta and Athens, the Peloponnesian War. Sparta technically won, but really no one was the winner because Greece was ruined. And, you know, at the end of the Hundred Years' War, you, you might say France was the winner, but, oh my goodness, all the people that died, all that they went through, all because England wanted land. But of course the English would say, but we have a right to it. It's our family inheritance, which was true because of William the Conqueror. This is why history is a hard thing to discuss. Everyone's got a point of view and we weren't there. We don't know what motivated people to do what they did. We can only make guesses. We can read what they wrote, but people don't always write the truth, do they? History is hard. So sometimes we need to keep an open mind when we study history because we weren't there and we don't know what motivated them. Sometimes the motivations are bad. Sometimes they are well-meaning. And of course, we know what's going to happen because of the decisions they make they don't know what's going to happen. We judge them from a place where we know the ending, but they didn't know the ending. So history study is hard. Okay, so for next week, in the Dorothy Mills book, I would like you to read chapter 22, part one. This is not a very pleasant section. It's about the Black Death, the plague, which is I know it's difficult to talk about maybe um, when we are dealing with a virus right now, but I hope it puts it in perspective. The, the virus that we're dealing with is nothing like this. This was a, was a horrible time in Europe in the mid 1300s. So at the beginning of chapter 22, it just says the close of the Middle Ages. I want you to read that part. And then I want you to read part one, the Black Death and the Passing of Feudalism. Okay, read that for next week. And now I'd like to say a few words about, I'm going to set this book down out of my way. I'd like to say a few books about our Joan of Arc book by Mark Twain. I hope you are enjoying this book. I hope that you can see what I mean when I say that Mark Twain loved Joan of Arc. He reveres her. Isn't she just the portrait of her vivid, beautiful, but respectful? Can't you see how much he loves her through the mouth of the Sour de la Conte, her secretary? Remember, he's, he's actually a historical figure, but the words in his mouth are being put there by Mark Twain. All right. So the portion that I had you read had a, had a few things that I, I wanted to point out. She's, she's gathering her army. She's gathered her army. She has, let's see, you've read up through page three. Yes, she has um, raised the siege of Orléans. And remember, this is um, a uh, pivotal place because when, um, if the English took Orléans, it opened a gateway for them to just basically take over the rest of the country. It was a pivotal military location. And so to lift that siege and to take Orléans back into the hands of the French was a huge turning point in the war. And it not only was it m m to their advantage militarily, but it raised their spirits. It raised morale. Yay, Orléans. So she got a nickname there, right? She's the maid of Orléans. She raised the siege. She rallied the men. She gave them new hope. 
in the portion that you read for this week, there were a couple of really interesting things, interesting characters. Um, one was she met a guy being led off to execution. He was a deserter. But, you know, remember Joan has the seeing eye, one character said. She sees, she sees the heart. She sees what's in a man and not appearance. And so to appearance, well, he, he ran away from his post. He's a deserter. And you are executed for desertion when you're in the army. But she sees something more in him. So she asks him, uh, because he's a big, tough guy, he doesn't look like a coward. He doesn't look like this sort of person to just run away in fear and desert. So she has him untied and... Um, she asks for, for someone to tend his wrists. She tends them herself. And I loved this paragraph. It says, The man looked on silent while he was being bandaged, stealing a furtive glance at Joan's face occasionally, such as an animal might that is receiving a kindness from unexpected quarter and is gropingly trying to reconcile the act with its source. All the staff had forgotten the huzzahing army drifting by in its rolling clouds of dust to crane their necks and watch the bandaging as if it was the most interesting and absorbing novelty that ever was. I have often seen people do like that, get entirely lost in the simplest trifle when it is something that is out of their line. Now there in Poitier once, I saw two bishops and a dozen of those grave and famous scholars grouped together watching a man paint a sign on a shop. They didn't breathe. They were as good as dead. And when it began to sprinkle, they didn't know it at first. Then they noticed it, and each man hove a deep sigh and glanced up with a surprised look, as wondering to see the others there and how he came to be there himself. But that is the way with people, as I have said. There's no way of accounting for people. You have to take them as they are. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been so absorbed in looking at something you, you forgot where you were? You didn't notice it was raining? Because it was just so interesting to you. Mark Twain is saying, just like that, this is kind of a long simile, you know. He's comparing the man to an animal. He's comparing a man to people who are distracted by something. He's just staring at her while she bandages his hands. Like, he, he doesn't really understand what's going on. There, said Joan at last, pleased with her success. Another could have done it no better. Not as well, I think. Tell me, what is it you did? Tell me all. The giant said, it was this way, my angel. My mother died. Then my three little children, one after the other, all in two years. It was the famine. Others fared so. It was God's will. I saw them die. I had that grace, and I buried them. Then when my poor wife's fate was come, I begged for leave to go to her. She who was so dear to me, she who was all I had, I begged on my knees, but they would not let me. Could I let her die friendless and alone? Could I let her die believing I would not come? Would she let me die and she not come, with her feet free to do it if she would, and no cost upon it, but only her life? Ah, she would come. She would come through the fire. So I went. I saw her. Notice the VSS series here. She died in my arms. I buried her. Then the army was gone. I had trouble to overtake it, but my legs are long and there are many hours in a day. I overtook it at last. So Joan thinks about it and she says, this sounds like a true story. Then she asks him, did you know it was death to come back to the army? Yes, he said, I knew it. Then why did you do it? The man said quite simply, because it was death. She was all I had. There was nothing left to love. Ah, yes, there was France. The children of France have always their mother. They cannot be left with nothing to love. You shall live and you shall serve France. I will serve you. You shall fight for France. I will fight for you. You shall be France's soldier. I will be your soldier. 
you shall give all your heart to France. I will give all my heart to you and all my soul, if I have one, and all my strength, which is great, for I was dead and am alive again. I had nothing to live for, but now I have. You are France for me. You are my France, and I will have no other. Joan is his France. And then because he's so big, he has this funny nickname, the dwarf. It's sort of like Little John. All right. So they call him the dwarf, and he has a huge axe, like Little John has his quarterstaff. And uh, she makes him one of his, one of her men at arms, one of her bodyguard, basically. Um, to the dwarf, Joan was France, the spirit of France made flesh. He never got away from that idea that he had started with, and God knows it was the true one. That was a humble eye to see so great a truth where some others failed. To me, that seems quite remarkable. And yet, after all, it was, in a way, just what nations do. When they love a great and noble thing, they embody it. They want it so that they can see it with their eyes. Like liberty, for instance. Isn't it interesting that we have a statue of liberty? They are not content with the cloudy, abstract idea. They make a beautiful statue of it, and then their beloved idea is substantial, and they can look at it and worship it. And so it is, as I say, to the dwarf, Joan was our country embodied. Our country made visible flesh, cast in a gracious form. When she stood before others, they saw Joan of Arc, but he saw France. And that embodiment of France lifts the siege of Orléans. Um, one other um, section that I remarked at, after she lifts the siege, the Dauphin wants to know what reward she wants. And all the courtiers are really, really jealous, aren't they? Like, ooh, I know what I would ask for if that were offered to me. I'd want you know, wealth and riches, and oh, she can have anything she wants. I wonder what she's going to ask for. Do you remember what she asked for? Um, she says, um, just a second, I'm looking for it. Be patient with me. Oh, dear and gracious Dauphin, I have but one desire, only one, that you will not delay a day. My army is strong and valiant and eager to finish its work. March with me to Rams and receive your crown. You could see the indolent king shrink in his butterfly clothes. Oh, I want to go. It's scary. There might be bad guys on the way. This is all she wants. Let me crown you king. Let me take you to the place where French kings are crowned and officially make you king of France. Because remember, there is a rival Henry VI. You know, there's a rival king. Let me crown you king. Make it official. And all his advisors say, oh, we ought to wait. Wait for what, she says. How, how's it going to be better if we wait? So he goes. He goes. But he also gives her something else. Um, uh, she also begs, use me, use me, there is but little time, okay, because um, she says, I will only last a year. Her voices have told her, I will only last a year. And he answers and says, thou art so simple, so true, so great, so noble, and by this accolade I join thee to the nobility of France thy fitting place. And for thy sake I do hereby ennoble all thy family and all they can, and all their descendants born in wedlock, not only in the male, but also in the female line. Oh my goodness. He just made her whole family nobility. Her parents and, and, and her brothers, her two brothers, are now noblemen. They're not peasants anymore. They're noblemen. But of course, Oh, and, to, and they can put, they can put, they, they, they have their own coat of arms. They can display it. 
She doesn't care. She just wants to do what she has been called to do by God. All right. Now, we are going to move. In my book, this is divided into book one, volume one and volume two. Okay? I hope that it's that way for yours. If it's not, it's okay. We finished through chapter 27 of book two. And in my book, it, it filters over into volume two. If it doesn't, we're, we're still in book two, though. I would like you to read the rest of book two through chapter um, 41. All right. Um, it starts with a chapter called Joan Foretells Her Doom. That's an ominous, ominous sounding chapter. All right. So that will take us uh, up through like the first 400 of the 600 pages or so that are in my book. Okay. So we're, we're halfway through right now. You should be halfway through the Joan of Arc book. And we're finishing book two up through chapter 41 this week. All right. So let's recap before I turn off the video. Um, so you are working on finding a topic which you can have an opinion on, right? It can be, I don't know, whether love seats are better than sofas. I don't care. Carpet versus hard floors. Anything you can have an opinion on. It needs to be something, preferably, you can have a pretty strong opinion on because that will help you generate ideas. And then you're going to just put it into three categories. Um, and, you know, it might help if you just started by getting a sheet of paper and brainstorming all the ways it's better or all the ways something else is worse. Then you can group them into like categories. All right. If you're having trouble with that, what are you going to do? You're going to call me. Call or email, but call is better and I will sit down with you and we will brainstorm together. I'm very happy to do that. Or, or it doesn't have to be or, it can be in addition to calling me. You can ask parents. Brothers and sisters, grandmas, grandpas, ask other people, what's your opinion? Why do you think this is better? Give me some reasons, all right? And collect them and put together an outline. Three categories of reasons why you have that opinion, all right? Get that part done this week. Get the body paragraphs done. We're doing full dress ups, openers, the ones you've learned, one through four. And if you're feeling like a challenge, out of VSS, a very short sentence, five words or less. Okay, You are going to start in the Dorothy Mills book, you're going to start chapter 22 and you're going to read the little prologue and part one on the Black Death. And you are going to finish book two in the Joan of Arc book through chapter 41. This will also be posted on the website. The homework will be posted on the website. You, you shouldn't, I'm not sending out a lot of attachments this week. You should have only just got um, the uh, checklist, I think is the only thing. If I think of something else that would be cool, I'll send it along. I'll try to remember to send a link to the Henry V speech. If I forget, you can email him, me and say, hey, Mrs. Ferguson, where's the link to that speech? And it will remind me because I don't remember everything. But don't tell anyone. All right. I hope you guys are safe and well. Hope your families are faring well and um, have a good week. I'm here if you need me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.